Hey guys, let's take a quick break from chemistry and talk about stress. Actually, you know what? Scratch that. Let's talk about stress and how it applies to chemistry in the form of Le Chatelier's principle. So, with a system at equilibrium, if you stress that system, it will cause equilibrium to actually shift in order to reduce that stress. Chemicals are actually a lot like us. They don't really like stress. And so if they're stressed out, they're going to do things to relieve that stress. So your little brother is stressing you out. You go to your room. Your job is stressing you out. You change jobs. Chemicals feel stress. They shift equilibrium. And while your teenage self has a billion different things that stress you out, chemicals actually only have three. Pressure, concentration, and temperature. So we're going to start off talking about pressure. So pressure stress only applies to systems with gases because solids, liquids, and aqueous things are not affected by pressure. So let's remember with pressure of a sealed system, there's going to be a total pressure of the container, the balloon, the flask, whatever it is, and that is equal to the pressure of gas 1 plus the pressure of gas 2 plus the pressure of gas 3, so on and so forth for however many or how few the gases there are. And then Kp is equal to the pressure of the products raised their value over the pressure of the reactants. So if we were to change the pressure of the system, we change the pressure, we change the total pressure. A change in the total pressure as a result is going to change the pressure of each thing inside there because the total, those three have to add up to. So if we change the total pressure, we change the partial pressures. If we change the partial pressures, we are going to change this into a Q. And so we're going to change what the starting values are. And that is a stress because the system is no longer at equilibrium because if we change the partial pressures, the uh, ratio of those two is no longer going to be equal to Kp. And so what's the system going to do? It's going to relieve the stress in order to reestablish Kp. So this value right here will not change in the end. It's going to change right when the pressure changes, but the system's going to do something in order to get this number to go back to what it was. So here's an example. If we have a gas like this right here, and we decrease the volume, or pressure and volume according to Boyle's law are inversely proportional, so if we decrease the volume, we increase the pressure. So this system right here is going to be under greater pressure. So if we look at our equilibrium system, it's N2H2 and NH3. So over on this side right here, we have four moles of gas. And over on this side, we only have two moles of gas. So if we were to think about these two sides isolated, this side would have more pressure than what this side does. So if we increase the pressure of the system, what can equilibrium do in order to relieve stress? Well, it's going to move this way. It's going to move towards the right because when it moves to the right, it's going to decrease the amount of moles of gas inside of the vessel, therefore relieving the pressure and getting the pressure back to what it once was. So by increasing the number of products, we relieve the pressure on the system and therefore we reestablish equilibrium. And we can see from this picture down here how it went from 14 gaseous molecules, here's how many of each, when you stress the system and it moved to the right, we went up to six ammonias and then dropped those guys down, therefore relieving the pressure. And same thing applies in reverse. So if we decrease the pressure on the system, the system is going to try and move to relieve that stress, fill in that void that we've removed by increasing the pressure. So it's going to shift towards the side with more moles of gas, therefore reducing the stress. Once equilibrium is reestablished, the Q, so what we changed it to, is going to change into the KEQ. So it'll go back to what it once was. So here's the same equation, just going backwards. So we started with a high pressure. If we uh, increase the volume, we decrease the pressure, and that's going to cause equilibrium to shift over towards the left. And so it's going to generate more moles of gas in order to fill in that void and increase the pressure. So the pressure of this system, the pressure of this system are going to be identical. The equilibrium KEQ of this system and the KEQ of this system are also going to be identical. All right, if we change the concentration of one or more of the species inside of a system that is already equilibrium, we are therefore going to be changing the Q again. So just like we did with pressure, if we think of the Kc equation, so the concentration, it's the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. So if we increase the concentration of either the products or the reactants, we're going to be changing from the Kc, and that's going to establish a Q. And so the system is then going to shift. It's going to decrease or increase a particular concentration in order to reestablish Kc. In the end, after equilibrium has been reestablished, it's going to be the same as it was before. 
you look at the same system as we did before. It's still the N2H2 yielding ammonia. So a system at equilibrium, we notice the size of the container stays the same, so we're not affecting pressure at all. We've got those molecules, and we've got a certain number, 1, 1, and 3. If we were to stress that system by adding 5 more ammonias, the system is no longer at equilibrium. We have increased the concentration of NH3. We have more NH3s in the same volume. So the system has to respond in order to relieve that stress. It now has more NH3s than what equilibrium should be able to handle. More NH3s means more ability for them to react, and so as a result, equilibrium is going to shift back this way, thus decreasing the amount of NH3s, and in the process, increasing the number of N2 and H2. Once it does that, we don't return to the exact same picture as we had before, but we do return to the exact same ratio. And so in the end, then, some of those NH2s that we did when we stressed the equilibrium are going to turn into N2s and H2s, and as a result, reestablish that equilibrium we had before. So an increase in the concentration of NH3 resulted in an increase in the concentration of both N2 and H2, shifting equilibrium to the left. I won't spend too much time on this, but the same thing goes with decreasing concentrations. If you remove something from the system, the system is going to respond by filling in that void and reestablishing equilibrium. So same system, here it is at equilibrium. If we remove some of those ammonias, we have decreased the concentration of ammonia. Decreasing the concentration is a stress, and so the system is no longer at equilibrium. It'll reestablish equilibrium by shifting towards the right, thus filling in that void by increasing the concentration of NH3. So we decrease it, equilibrium increases it back to what it was. That's going to decrease the concentration of N2 and H2, thus reestablishing equilibrium. Dilution, that's kind of like changing the concentration. So if you've got an aqueous solution like salt water, if you pour more water into that, you're increasing the volume without increasing the number of moles, and therefore you're decreasing the concentrations. So if you add water to an aqueous system that's at equilibrium, that is a stress. However, adding water, you are decreasing the number of particles of everything or the concentration of everything. So the system is going to respond by shifting towards the side with the most particles, with more particles, just like pressure shifted towards the side with the more or less moles of gas. So here, for example, we have an aqueous solution of hydrofluoric acid. Uh, if we add water to it, that's going to increase the volume, but we didn't change the number of moles. And so the system is going to respond by shifting towards the side that has more particles. And so in this equilibrium, we see this side has one particle, this side has two. And so it's going to shift this way and reestablish equilibrium. And so the concentration of this solution is going to be the same as the concentration of this solution. Let's talk about temperature. So this is kind of like you. You're sitting in a room and, man, it starts getting hot. What do you do? You move to a colder room. You're sitting in a room and, man, it's getting pretty cold. So what do you do? You move to a warmer room. Equilibrium is the same way, and this is where thermodynamics starts to apply. So we've learned about exothermic and endothermic reactions, and you have to figure out what type of reaction each equilibrium is before you can do a Le Chatelier with temperature. And I'd also like to point out this is the only form of stress that is actually going to change the value of KEQ. When the system shifts to relieve stress, it is not going to reestablish the same KEQ. It will actually change the equilibrium constant. So if we cool a system that's at equilibrium, brr, it starts getting cold, what's it going to do? It's going to shift towards the side that generates the heat. So in this reaction, this is an exothermic reaction, we see that the heat is on the product side, and so it's going to turn up the heat on its own system by shifting towards that direction, thus generating more heat. Oh, if things start getting way too hot then, what's it going to do? It's going to shift away from the heat, so it's going to move towards the colder side, which is going to be the side that does not generate heat. And if this was an endothermic reaction, it would just do the opposite. So if the heat was over on the reactant side, if you cool it down, it's going to shift towards the reactant side. If the heat is over here on the reactant side and you turn up the heat, it's going to move away towards the products.